Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar on containment design considerations. My name is Paul Chappers. I'm the technical events manager at NAPET. And joining me on this um, webinar will be Richard Townsend, our technical editor. We're going to start looking at designers requirements. So, Richard, I'm going to bring you in early on for this one. Can you just sort of talk to, talk to us a little bit about what the responsibilities of a designer is and who is the designer? Well, let's take, for example, a bigger site. You'll probably find before you even get to do any work there, a design's been carried out, set of drawings, and everything's laid out for you. Everything's been ordered in. It's going to be in containers. You're going to go and get stuff and you're going to walk, work to a design. So you're not the designer. You're probably going to fill in the section for installations or you may be the inspector or tester and you will you will test the circuit you put in. You may energize it. You may not. Um, so you may be the person that comes along at the end and does it. But the key thing here is that designer has to make sure that everything's in place before any work's carried out. Now, for a lot of sole traders and owner operators, you might be the designer, the installer, the inspector, the tester. So you will you can do a, a single uh, single signatory EIC uh, and you will be responsible for the whole design. Now, when we talk about the design, a lot of people just think, well, I need five kilowatts over there. So I need this bigger cable here, an MCB there and I'm done. But it's not as simple as that. We've got to make the correct selection for any kind of containment that we use. Um, and when we talk about containment, we've got to look at whether it's fit for purpose. How is it going to be ma maintained? Is someone going to maintain it? Is it going to be internal maintenance team, an external maintenance team? How easy is it going to be for us to access it? Is it in a special location? Is there a special requirement? Does it have to be stainless? Does it have to be gal? Can it be plastic? Can it be PVC? Does it have to be UV protected? So above all else, when we look at our containment, we've got to maybe think about external influences that could possibly be present. When we think about uh, external influences, um, we're going to be looking at other considerations too. So chapter 13 asks us to look at cables and conductors, connections, terminations, any jointing, associated supports and suspensions. That's quite important when we're putting together large pieces of tray, basket, trunking, anything that's going to be overhead, because if we have too big a gap in between our supports or we haven't um, anchored our uh, drop rods or anything like that in a in a suitable substrate, we could uh, we could be in a lot of problems if we're overloading our tray with too heavy a cable. On top of that, we've got to look at enclosure methods against protection against external influences. So the conduit and the trunking or trunking I'm going to be talking about has got to have a specific IP rating or it's got to be capable of looking at uh, with stain, withstanding the particular external influence. And when we look at external influences, we go to Appendix 5. So Chapter 52 of the external influences, Appendix 5 gives us all of the different ones it could be, and there are loads. Um, and you generally get two letters and a number, and that's the wine rigs external influence categorization. The first one gives you the environment or the utilization or the construction of the building or wherever it's going to be. The second one generally gives you the external influence. So A is temperature, D is water, uh, and so on and so forth. Then they give you a number, and then that number will, will, will pertain to a particular requirement. So for ambient temperature, the number will be, will give a, an indication of um, a temperature or thermal band that's required. And for D, for water, um, it will give droplets or jets or something else. Or whatever it or whatever it needs to be, which we then convert into something else. So if Paul can just whip through and he's going to talk us what though through what those external influences are from an IP um, um, perspective, because what we what we see in 7671 as a requirement equates to something else. OK, thanks, Rich. And straight away, you know, lots of information there to take on board and as you say a lot of the contractors they just got to do a job and they think hey i use that cable this that and the other are they really considering those fundamental requirements of chapter 13 and then the requirements of chapter 52 so 
these are the external influences that chapter 52 um, relates to uh, ambient temperature. Are we going to be installing our wiring system anywhere where we could have a concern over the, the ambient temperature? Or is there an external heat source? Presence of water or high humidity is another one. And most of the contractors are, are familiar with uh, dealing with those locations. Solid foreign bodies and the list goes on. It may be an impact problem, is it in a car park? Or could it be an environment where it might be subject to vandalization? You know, so we really do need to look at all of these things and see, is there gonna be a problem? We've got presence of fauna there. Fauna is like insects and birds nests and things like that. So you've got to take the location, the job, everything in mind, look at these external influences and see how they relate to the design. So here's an example of some IP codes. Um, we've got the presence of water, which is AD, and then we have one to eight, and one is negligible through to immersion. And then on the right hand side there, we've got the um, international protection code, which relates to protection against those areas. OK, so if it's got an X and then a number, it's generally when we're dealing with water. And then you see on the bottom there where we're dealing with solid objects, it's a number and then the X is on the end there because we're not worried about water. And if you add, for instance, IP 44, it'd be because it was protecting against small objects and water splashes. So that's a little explanation of IP codes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with anyway. Moving on. We're just going to have a quick look at this uh, this picture here. You may have seen this before. We we often use this when we're talking about external influences. It's one of the one of the stock images we have at Napier, and it's just to show how a designer would look at this. It's a simple installation where a socket outlet's been used to power up some equipment. That equipment comes with a big bulky plug or some controls or a timer on it. So you've got to enclose that. So the designer in this installation um, has said, well, I'm going to have a steel wired armored cable for my supply to the socket that is going to provide mechanical protection. We're going to use a IP waterproof box to house the equipment. We can also use some conduit um, just to take a medium impact because the gardener is going to be in there doing some pruning, etc. So it's an example of how all of these considerations come together. Now, we're going to look at making the correct selection and I'm going to hand back over to Richard to go through this here. Richard's going to explain sort of the difference between a wiring system and containment. Yeah, uh, lots of people think <clears throat> they're the same and they're not. Containment is basically something which will hold a wiring system, OK? So if we take trunking, that is um, a wiring system. It's part of a wiring system because inside that we have single insulated conductors. So and the, the, the trunking provides the mechanical protection. So that is a wiring system. A tray or any kind of ladder or racking or anything like that. But that's containment. It's not wiring system because it's only there to hold a cable, which is a wiring system. A wiring system is uh, twin and earth, uh, any kind of armoured cables, any kind of HO cables where you've got primary basic and a secondary mechanical uh, covering, which we call a wiring system. How we then um, deal with that containment and how we keep them um, is is, is our problem. That's that's when the problem starts because we've then got to start piling them up onto either tray, basket, conduits, inside trunking. Uh, there's a picture there and that's a crossover T. Um, that's a nifty design. If you want to take uh, cables out of your trunking, by the way, you can come around there and it gets us around a problem of um, overfilling uh, trunking and some of the constraints we have with grouping. That's prevalent because what we're going to talk about next in the next couple of slides is going to have an effect on when we choose cables to uh, be careful we don't overfill them. There's lots of other things we need to take into consideration. So for light commercial and domestic property projects, uh, a lot of guys like to use PVCU trunking. Um, 
why wouldn't you? It's light, easy to handle, uh, easy to bend, easy to, you know, if you make a mistake, throw it away, get another bit, it's quite cheap. Uh, it's easy to work with, as I've said. It'll stand most external influences, and if you're in somewhere where you've got a lot of vapour, we have got a lot of moisture, it's probably better than um, galv or any kind of steel conduit or trunking. I know galvanised says that it's uh, rust proof, but I'm fairly sure we've all been on some ICRs and seen some damp environments where galvanised steel has probably not fared so well. It tends to be maintenance free. Nothing's maintenance free generally. I know some equipment, we might have some maintenance free joints, but we, everything generally needs a little bit of a tweak over a 30, 40 year life cycle. So next one, Paul. So sizing considerations. Lots of contractors um, kind of do it the wrong way around. They'll say, do you know what? I'm going to, I've got this small, this small unit here. I'm going to wire that up. I'll get 100, uh, some 100 trunking or some 150 trunking. I'll put it in and that should do me. I'll, I'll get that all in there. Then when they get to the end of the job, they're finding themselves having to uh, stand on the lid to get everything in. That's no good. You've probably way gone past um, the requirements for thermal efficiency and thermal restraints on that conduit system. What you should do is design all of your cables uh, and all of your circuits, uh, the type of containment you're going to put them in, whether you're going to put them in a trefoil, uh, a trefoil um, um, sort of arrangement, so in threes, uh, if you've got three phase systems, um, and you're going to take into consideration any grouping factors, because when we bunch cables together, um, we group them together, they are then going to be subjected to thermal issues and thermal constraints, which causes us to derate them. So we can't really derate them if we need them for a particular current carrying capacity. So we have to put a larger one in. Put a larger one in, we start to fill our trunking up. So straight away, we may have um, gone wrong and inadvertently picked the wrong size trunking. So we have to make sure that the cables we fit are not going to be um, uh, subjected to any grouping factors which might mm, diminish their current carrying capacity. And when we look at that, um, a lot of, uh, when we calculate for a trunking, we, we historically will go 45% and no more, because the other 55% is uh, really to dissipate heat and give us some physical ability to get in there and do what we need to do. So we don't really want to be filling trunking up for the sake of filling it up. We can't really go above 45%. Slightly different for uh, conduit, if Paul could just flick through the next one. So when we think about conduit, that's not about the, the thermal constraints. There will be thermal constraints uh, in the end, but when we're pulling cables into trunking, uh, conduit, sorry, whether it's plastic or galvanised, we have to take into consideration a regulation 522.8.1. And that means you've got to avoid damage to the sheath of the insulation. Now, they're really, really delicate. They have no mechanical protection. When you look at a single insulated cable, that's just basic insulation. The hard, tough, durable stuff is missing from them. That's why they're in that particular type of wiring system where they're in a conduit or they're in a trunking. So when you start heaving them through, they'll rub against each other, they'll rub against the sides of the conduit, and it doesn't take long to wear them away and get them down to the conductor. We've then got an exposed conductor, and that cable has to be removed and refitted, and possibly one that it's rubbed against as well. So it's extremely important to understand when we reach the maximum fill for um, conduit, it's not about how much we've got in, are we dissipating the heat? It's making sure we don't damage the cables when we put them in. So now that's conduit and sizing for conduit. I'm just going to hand back to Paul and he's going to take us through some considerations for trunking because that's equally as important. OK, thanks, Rich. Yeah, really good stuff there. Um, trunking, quite uh, straightforward. The best thing to do is to use manufacturer's data. OK, each size of cable is given a common factor and each trunking size has been allocated a capacity factor. You'll probably remember this from way back when, or you may be using these tables, um, but it's a good reminder for everybody on how it's done and I'm going to go through it now. 
So for each size of cable required to be contained within the trunk and section being designed, you simply multiply, multiply the number by the common factor. Add it all together and the results of the calculations for the cable sizes to select the cable trunk end, which must have a capacity factor which is equal to or greater than uh, this total. OK, so these um, tables here are uh, kindly supplied from Legrand. Um, just have a quick look at them. You can see there on the left hand side, we've got the cable sizes and factors. And then on the right hand side, we have the uh, trunking capacity uh, factors. OK, you add all your cables up and then you can work out which size of trunking you need quite simply. And as Richard said right at the beginning, you've got to do your design first because if your design because you're grouping the cables calls for you to put a bigger cable in, it's going to end up with a different cable factor, which is going to result in a different trunk in size. So here's a worked example. Calculate the total volume needed for selecting the appropriately sized trunk in for the following stranded conductors. <coughs> so we've got 21.5s. Looking at those tables, that's a factor of 8.6, 20 times 8.6, 172, and so on. 32 uses a factor of 12.6, 28 um, four mil cables uses 16.6 and 18 six mil cables uses 47.8 factor. You add all that together and it gives us an answer of 1900. OK, so now we need to pick the nearest trunking capacity factor, um, which is 2091, which gives us 100 B50 um, capacity. OK, so that's the nearest next size up. Quite simple to do, very easy to do. And as Richard said, if you fly in to start with and just pick a size because it's uh, it looks about right and engineer and judgment, you may have done it before. If you get to doing the actual installation and you find you're in the wrong, there's no backup because the manufacturers um, print this material. It's readily available. These tables come from some articles that I drafted in the last few Compton Persons magazines. So if you're wanting to get your hands on them, have a look at the previous magazines. We also need to consider other things when we're doing our design. OK, so depending on the type of installation, maybe desirable to select the next size up, allowing for future additions. And you really need to discuss the pros and the cons with the client. It might be that the client has said, I'm building this workshop. I know I'm going to have X amount of machines in it, but I'm expecting to expand later in the year and you really need to discuss things. So let's bring Richard in um, just for this discussion. Well, it's all right thinking about extra cost. So let's say we've got a small unit and you've got a three phase supply, but most of the stuff you're putting in is single phase. And the client says, well, next year I'm going to put a load of three phase induction motors and this and that and the other, and some air handlers and everything else here, yeah, there and everywhere. Suddenly, the smaller trunking and tray and basket that you've put in might not cut it. So even though you haven't got any of the bigger cables in yet, you know that in future they're going to be brought in. So at this stage, it's a consideration for you to have a conversation with the client and say there's an extra cost. If you want that future build into it, we'd have to think about it now. So those extra heavy duty cables, or it could be a multitude of different cables, could be a lot of signal cables, could be anything. We need to think about our containment and our wiring systems now so that we can expand them adequately when you want to go to the next stage. It's always difficult, especially if you start looking at grouping factors. If you've got some big motors uh, running some big cables and they're all in treffle, um, uh, a, tr a treffle design on top of your tray, there's a chance they could start to get quite warm. So then we're looking at grouping factors if we've got lots of them shoved together. That makes a, a, an issue if we're going to start up in the size of the conductors. So we've got to be very careful. So when a client says to you, or if a, if a client says, doesn't, doesn't give you any indication that they're going to expand it, it's always best to ask them because we've all been there. Uh, thanks for that. Can I call you next year um, when I'm putting the other working unit in and the other 20 lathes and this, that and the other. And then you've got to tell them at that point that their installation is not really future proof for that. Um, and that could go south from a, um, a, a friendly situation very quickly. So always ask at the very start what their 
future plans are because it might be that you have to think about it now because it could be too late when you come to the the next part it's a it's a really good thing rich and and just something that just sprung to mind then is you know in my experience i've worked in lots of <laughs> industrial workshops you go into an existing trunk and it's jam-packed the cables all fall out of the lid and that 55 percent space that that we talked about has been long gone and exceeded okay at that point if you're being asked to install a new cable into there you really need to say no it needs a new containment because it'd be just your luck if you install the new circuit and there is a problem something gets overheated it's been your fault because you've been the last person in there but you know many times i've seen people jam things into containment and you really do need to consider that that spacing factor it's unlikely you're going to get the full set of design criteria so then we're really looking at the spacing factor sorry to cut in there rich just thought that was worth okay, uh, no, no, throwing no. in. so paul sort of um spoke a bit earlier about ip systems and external influences so something we need to look at when we're talking about trunking systems so regulation 52110 permits us using single insulated conductors to be installed in trunking systems provided the minimum degree of protection provided is either IPXXD or IP4X. Now they are actually, although very similar, quite different and um, we're going to explain that shortly. So non sheet cables enclosed throughout in conduit or ducting or trunking are also covered by a similar requirement. So can only be removable uh, or, or the lids could only be removed by deliberate action by use of a tool. So that's the regulation. So what is IP4X and what is IPXXD? Well, IP4X means a one millimeter probe can't enter. OK, so if we look at that picture there, one millimeter probe, it can't actually get in. But IPXXD, you can have a one millimeter probe and it can get into the conduit or the trunking. However, live parts must be protected by insulation of some description and they can't come into contact with it. That's fine. That's absolutely, you know, it's been like that time immemorial. So when you start to specify uh, trunking uh, and you're going to specify a particular manufacturer's type, you need to make sure that that particular manufacturer can produce for you an IP4X rated trunking and, uh, trunking, trunking and lid system. Uh, you can see some covers there and various bits and pieces. I believe that's the grand equipment there we've got with that um, specialist bracket there. But yes, we need to be very careful. And if we are going to do any site made uh, cuts or joints, it's unlikely that we can we can then come up with an IP 4X solution. Because when you cut things yourself on site, no matter how cute you are, you're always going to get a bit of a gap. So provided you can meet IPXXD, generally site made cuts can be OK. Excellent. I'll hand it over to you, Paul, for some fire action. Yeah. Um, first of all, we're going to look at the size and considerations for conduit. OK, so. In order to establish how many conductors can fit in there, you need the cable factors for each conductor size. So it's very similar to the trunk end. OK, you add all the factors together and then you compare them with the conduit factor. OK, part of the process is to consider the length of run and how many bends are needed. OK, the more bends, the longer the runs will have a direct bearing on the difficulty of the cable pull. Remember what Richard said, it's all about what damage is caused to that cable insulation on pulling it in. So the more distance you've got to go, the more bends, the more friction. So the tables reflect that, OK? So they're split up into two sort of areas. One is just for short uh, runs of conduit, OK? Short, straight runs, really. And when we look at these factors, they're very easy. You see what cables you're using you get the cable factors you add them all together and then you choose a conduit factor and that dictates what size you need um, when we look at longer runs we need to consider the um, length of run and how many bends so when you're planning out your route 
all of these things can be taken into account. You may say, if I go that way, I need three bends because I've got to get around, you know, that pillar or whatever. But if I go that way, and you need to bear in mind that it does make a difference on what you um, what you choose to go in there, what size. We'll do a worked example again, OK? A lighting circuit for a scout hut requires the installation of a conduit system with a nine metre length. So we need to remember the nine metres and also that it's got two bends. The number of cables required is eight times 1.5 millimetre PVC cables. We need to calculate the size required. So step one is to select the appropriate table. Remember, we've got two different tables, short runs or longer runs with bends. Step two, obtain the cable factor for 1.5, which is 22. Step three, apply the cable factor to the number of conductors. We add uh, 22 times eight gives us 176, okay? So now that we need to select the conduit size with a conduit factor greater than 176, okay? So if we look along the nine, on the left-hand side there, we've got the nine meters length for run, and then we go across to the two bend column, we can see that um, 176 is greater than what a 20 mil uh, conduit can take. So we have to move up to a 25 mil uh, conduit. And that's how it's done, quite simply. We also, when we're using PVC, um, PVCU uh, conduit, we need to think about how it expands because it expands and contracts more noticeably than steel. Um, and when you surface mount it to avoid any gaps or any bowing, you need to consider using expansion couplers. OK, normally where you've got bends and sets close together, the movement can be taken up in those areas. But for straight ones, you should install them approximately one every six metres. This is what an expansion coupler looks like if you haven't used one. So you glue or cement one conduit into the right hand side there. And the other one is free to slide in. So you need to insert about 50 mil and that will allow it to move 25 mil approximately each way um, to take up that expansion. And if it's an area where you need to keep it watertight, we recommend using silicon grease to keep that watertight. Also, we're looking at conduit supports right at the beginning. Richard talks about those um, requirements of Chapter 52 and supports were in there. So we often turn to manufacturers um, requirements for support to meet the, the regulation 5103. And we can see an example there. And, you know, I don't know if you can see, but in the first column there, we're looking at a conduit size between 16 and 25. And for horizontal, it's 1.5 metres. And, you know, it's quite a distance. And remember, these are maximum distances. They might um, prevent the cables from being damaged. But I would imagine you'd get a bit of sag at 1.5 on a plastic conduit. So, you know, probably you would be looking at putting more supports in than the maximums. But these are the maximums that have been supplied for this particular conduit. When we're looking at those supports, we also need to consider the old topic that come about in recent years of premature collapse. OK, so we have the regulation 5211002 concerning premature collapse. Now, Marshall Tuflex, who um, supplied these conduit data um, for the, for this article that, that we put together, recommend using these Firefly uh, clip samples that they've got there. Um, for premature collapse and they also give some advice on where supports should be regarding how close they are to bends and that and the maximum distance between the strap saddles should comply with the table that we we've just previously looked at now premature collapse we've done webinars on that we've talked about it at length but i'm just gonna ask richard if he could just round off this webinar by just explaining what we're seeing on the screen there okay so we've got some PVC conduit uh, and it's obviously going up a wall onto a ceiling or a roof space or, or an area above uh, and then it's branching off and we've got two metallic clips there uh, the silver ones so they need to be making sure that that um, that PVC conduit doesn't collapse prematurely 
Now that collapse could be a foot or two foot. You don't have to have the clips um, uh, every 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 one. You can you can miss a few out, and those few um, are, you'll get that data from the manufacturer as well, because it's not about uh, stopping it completely from uh, premature collapse. Although it would be a nice thing, it's uh, it's to try and stop it from being a hazard for those walking around underneath it, namely firefighters. So you need to be try and work out if I leave out four or five clips before I put another metallic clip in, um, how far is it going to sag that PVC? Uh, given that PVC when it does get warm does sag a lot, um, do I go three feet, do I go five feet? How high is the ceiling? Uh, how far is it to the edge? There's lots of things we need to think about. So when we're looking at premature collapse and conduit supports, always best to uh, take your cue from the manufacturer of the system that you're using. OK, thanks, Richard. That's very useful um, advice. Just to um, go over what I mentioned earlier, um, there's some articles with some further information uh, provided in the Competent Persons magazines. I think um, over the last two or three editions, we've covered conduit uh, trunking. There's also a ladder rack article which is not covered tonight in the ladder rack article me and richard have put some advice down on should it be bonded or aft so you know have a look at the magazine please um just to remind you that we have got a suite of documents that cover a lot of this information the on-site solutions covers premature collapse and wiring systems in, in length we've got a new guide there on test and inspection so Please have a look at those on NAPIC Direct if you need any further guidance. Also check out our training offerings because um, we've got plenty going on in that area of NAPIC. 